Welcome to a conversation all about media and local government. I'm really excited to be able to be here with you today. I'm Joanna Kohler. I'm going to be hosting the conversation. I um, am a producer and I have a background in sort of media literacy and, and community storytelling. So I'm very, very excited about this conversation that's going to be hosted by the Global Synergy Group, which has been working for the past three years um, between the Ukraine and Minnesota, between um, bringing the governments together, youth organizations, and business communities to talk about how can we share our culture, share our practices, and share sort of our ways of looking at building community. So hopefully today we get to better understand the really different contexts that each of our local governments are working, as well as our journalists and our media outlets are working, uh, and citizens as they look to their media and they look to their government and they look to each other to have conversations about how we build community. So one of the things that I think is, is exciting about this conversation is that if you look at Minnesota in the United States or you look at the Ukraine or in, at times, Russia, um, there's a very different context that we're working in. I mean, I think we take it for granted that we're talking about different stories that have to come out of local government or different communities that need to be able to understand their own community and participate, but they're very different contexts. And so briefly, I wanted to just sort of name that context. Um, and Matt, I actually wanted to ask you if you could just sort of you know, give folks a little bit of context, you know, in the United States, how do we look at the press? How do we look at journalism? Well, sure. Our journalism tradition in this country is really closely tied to our political history. Um, you know, the United States started as a component of Great Britain, you know, over 200 years ago, and then rebelled against British control. And so there is this desire to keep uh, government at bay from certain things that it was doing when America was controlled by Britain. Um, and one of those things that the, the early Americans wanted to keep control of was the dissemination of, of information. Um, and so the, the political deal that cemented the United States um, was the, the writing of the Constitution. And uh, there are 10 amendments to that Constitution, the very first of which guarantees freedom of the press and freedom of speech, as well as other um, associative kinds of freedoms. And so from the very beginning of the country, there is this context for keeping information free. Um, each of the states that comprise the United States also have their own constitutions, and those guarantee additional press freedoms or speech freedoms over and above the federal uh, freedoms in the First Amendment. And so that's the legal structure that exists right now. So no law at a federal level, for instance, can be written that takes away the, the, the freedoms guaranteed in that federal constitution in the First Amendment. It's a legal context, the setup in the, the constitution, but everything comes down to personalities and context. So, you know, there might be times when that, that freedom is, is really free and easy and flowing in the United States in different locations, and there's times when different personalities and contexts have happened where that's not necessarily the case. But I think that's, that's really important. You know, and as I was trying to get ready for this, this conversation and I was trying to understand sort of the Ukraine perspective of like what's taken for granted about the media you know like what's expected of the media in the Ukraine uh, first of all I would like to point out that uh, there is one goal for journalists in Ukraine it's to be objective and independent from the point of view of whoever is in power at the time mm -hmm. So there are three levels or three categories of uh, media outlets, if you will, ones that are uh, owned and directed by government and others that are private and independent. And then the third category is based on uh, civic and community perspective. So I am the owner of one of, or shouldn't say the owner, contributor to one of the more of a non-profit media outlet in Borispol, Ukraine. Of course, we have laws in Ukraine, uh, very well-written laws, that will protect both journalists and the freedoms of speech. And we can talk a long time about it and discuss it, whether or not it's working or not, but and it's there. <laughs> and of course, it's a big responsibility to deliver objective news to our people, because that will drive their moods, uh, that will drive their decisions and support for whatever issue we're discussing. On the other hand, you probably have heard about censorship. 
which right. is one of the barriers. It exists, and it's one of the barriers, um, and that creates difficulties for journalists to be objective and to deliver the messages that no, they wish. No, some positive. conflict situations occur when some journalists or reporters uh, confuse objective view of the issue with their own opinion. Yes, and, and that's when we begin um, debates and discussions around what was that news or what. Mary, you know, working with the city of, of Brooklyn Park, what are the kinds of things that are important for local government to, to create messaging about? You know, like what, what, are, what would be your goal as a communications person to, to communicate with the public? Well, my goal is to put it all out there in a transparent manner and just give people the facts. And I think it, it has worked, and we've had a lot of um, compliments on our communications, and I think, um, I think the transparency is a big part of it. It's really to get the facts out there. There's so much noise out there that our residents have to listen to now from different media sources, and we have a lot going on in our city. So um, an example right now um, in the, the West Metro of the Twin Cities, we're looking at adding a light rail line, right? A, a light rail transit is going to have huge impacts for decades to come, and there's lots of decisions being made in meetings and public meetings that the average citizen might not be engaged in. So it's our goal to try and attend those meetings, try and find the facts that are most important, um, learn about what decisions the public might be able to, to uh, participate in, and then sharing that with as many platforms as possible so that in the end we have an informed citizenry. And that is really how we kind of measure our success. We don't like it when people show up and say, we didn't know anything about this. We like it when they say, thank you for the communication on this. You know, so those are kind of like some of the ways that local government, I think, has to engage with, with media outlets. But, you know, Leo, I have a question you, with your background, but also now you're, you're in Minnesota and you're reporting for Russian community. Talk to me a little bit about, like, what are the steps that you go through when you get a story? Uh, you know, first of all, I would like to tell you that um, we have a really big community in, um, in Twin City. It's like more than 40,000 people. And our community make a really big investment in economic um, in Twin Cities. Uh, we have about 3,000 Russian owners, two, three years, and they start working and make business and uh, uh, very, very little among people of uh, welfare. So, uh, and another thing very important that um, Russian mentality, Russian, Ukrainian, this is, we are same, uh, one family here. Uh, we are trust in printing war. This is came from, of course, from Russia. That's why um, media is really important. And uh, people share with everything. Uh, we have our authors uh, who write uh, articles and we local uh, local news is only goes to our newspaper and uh, we share all problems and or all, all, everything that's happened especially in in russia right now as a fact right now it's going uh, really uh, conflict between russia and ukraine you know and uh, we are uh, people calling us and their opinion so we, we discuss in our uh, newspapers so we're uh, really active um, life in uh, in community, and we share uh, all news what is coming. And um, but the problem I, I would like to tell is that unfortunately we still don't have uh, still uh, communication with American press and American. Um, so this is my goal to make sure that um, we try to do like by language or uh, mi mix uh, to invite more American uh, to be involved in Russian, uh, in Russian community. And um, even through our advertising, a uh, lot of American companies, they really like to do business uh, in the Russian market. Has there been a time when you saw a real difference between the way that you were doing your work and the way like somebody who is native born Minnesotan was doing their work? Of course, it's, it's uh, sometimes it's a really big difference because it's a different culture. So when it's approach different 
and uh, of course a lot of things um, it's um, inappropriate uh, which is in, in Russian culture like uh, in American but um, at the same time I found out for myself and for my staff and for my readers that it's uh, completely like very um, uh, common uh, sense and uh, people understand each other so there is no no conflict barriers no barriers uh, in in, in, in our media. Uh, the only uh, problem uh, when people, uh, because you know, when people came here and now it's freedom and uh, everything we can, what they think they can put in printing work, this makes a really big sense. Uh, and uh, uh, this, was, this wasn't before and that's why people, uh, but like a couple years, people <laughs> used to, uh, to, to, to take this freedom and sometimes it's like too much freedom <laughs> you know like people are very uh, sometimes very angry when they try to put something uh, negative information which is uh, in printing world it's not appropriate so they start claim why it's freedom so you have to put like, like this so uh, freedom is um, i think for my uh, my uh, my philosophy and my opinion that uh, too much freedom is not good enough <laughs> Um, you know, James, as you're listening to Leo, are there things that, that you relate to that you're like, oh, absolutely, that's the same stuff I got to deal with, or is it a little bit different? Well, I think Americans probably err on the other side when it comes to freedom. I think we tend to push for more freedom, at least in the media world, and uh, we want more flexibility. If it's a coin toss, we're going to go with the side that errs for getting the information out there and sharing it, albeit doing it responsibly and, and ethically. But for the most part, I think we, and we have the same tiers of media outlets like Yuri talked about, you know, government-owned outlets, independent media organizations, community ones. I think Americans probably see a greater divide between the public-owned outlets and the independent outlets than maybe the, the Ukrainian ones do based on what I'm hearing. But other than that, it's, it's pretty similar. Do you, I mean, are you, are you thinking then that like the independent outlets are more like the, the public outlets? I don't think uh, the average American would classify maybe Jamie or Mary's current jobs as the same job that us three on this side of the table have. Oh, yeah. I think yeah. they would see us as even in opposition. It, we're, I think we work very collaboratively, um, more than people think. But I think they would see us as more antagonists than aligned in the same industry. That is like a perfect lead-in to my next question. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. This is how we collaborate in a media setting. <laughs> you know, Tom and Matt, both of you are kind of working from a little bit of a different angle. I mean, so we're, we're talking about, like, local government has something that it has to communicate. Then you have the vehicle of that communication. And then you have the opportunity to sort of, like, outside of those channels, have a specific me message and try to drive that forward. So. Tom, talk to me a little bit in, in your background, like how do you see your role fitting into this mix? Like how, if, if you've got an issue, you know, let's say around energy use, where do you plug in? What are you looking to when you look at the, the government or you're looking to a media outlet? Well, one of the things that um, I think we can uh, draw about the uh, American news consumer is that they're not always um, uh, uh, convinced by the facts. And a lot of people now are, are there's so much media and so much of availability to get the information that you want to hear to reinforce your own beliefs um, that I think it's really important that um, truly independent media um, is really a you know a guardian and uh, advocate for those facts um, and in and in that regard I think um, we share a common interest um, with local governments and getting that getting the truth out and getting the facts out. Um, I think there's a you know pressure in commercial media to make things a little bit more interesting and a little a little uh, more controversial uh, than they than they need to be. And I think there's probably a lot of common ground we have in that regard. So Matt, you know you you have a history of like really kind of challenging governments to in the United States, whether it's local governments, state governments, federal governments, to release information to the public. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that role and, and why you're passionate about sort of creating a, a larger transparency between government and citizens. Oh, sure. Um, so I 
have a, an organization called Public Record Media um, that seeks to get extract information out of the government. And uh, the reason why we formed this uh, a few years ago was that there are laws that mandate that all government information at the federal level and then states have their own laws should be available to the public unless it's classified otherwise by law. And so that was instituted back in the 1960s and 1970s uh, due to a variety of political scandals that happened in the country. And so there was a desire by the public to make sure that they could know what government was doing. Um, now those laws have become under more and more challenge in recent decades um, for a variety of reasons. And so public record media was formed to really use these laws as much as possible and also to, uh, to work in court to create what we call case law uh, about the application of these laws to try to be able to draw more information out of the government. Um, so what we've been doing over the last uh, couple years is trying to get information out of, say, the federal, a federal government agency. One thing we did was try to get information about drone uh, legal opinions. Does the federal government, for instance, believe they can kill U.S. citizens in this country with, with drones? And we had a big court battle over that, uh, trying to get that information out. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we, that we do, because we believe there should be this tension where the public that uses these laws pushes back against the agencies that try to protect information. I would imagine in those specific moments, there's that tension of like, what kind of national security risk is it? You know, um, what kind of, what if we put all this information out there, does it make us vulnerable? Um, or is it just that we want to be able to do something and we don't want the checks and balance of folks being able to, to question that? Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, in the Ukraine, is there a similar sort of push? Is there anything that's like, that has that sort of independent or um, like special interest kind of pushback on government to release information or to be more transparent? Interesting question. <coughs> Interesting question. Uh, interesting question. Uh, but the answer is very simple. My question is very simple. I think in every country, journalism is your second government. Uh, it, could be, it could be used as uh, a very rechag, uh, you know, what, what you use in the car to drive your government. <laughs> you can use it that way. That's it? <laughs> okay. okay. I, I think one of the important things I think of when I think of an organization like MATS, which is really pushing for the information, that makes the role of the journalist much more important to us in government. What we worry about um, when we release this information is that just tons of this information will just get thrown out there with no context. So I think that's why we sometimes see government hold back a little bit or they're nervous because they want the opportunity to tell the story with that context. Mm -hmm. Julian, if I yeah. could jump in. Um, first, I'd like to add a nuance. It's not always the community versus the government. Oftentimes the, the media is saying, is acting as an intermediary saying, hey, community, you really should care about this, and here's why, and the community will push back against the media. Um, there's some pressure to act as a cheerleader or whatever. Uh, I had a publisher who told me the journalist's job is to act as a mirror to reflect the community, and when you look in a mirror, hopefully you see a lot of what you like, but we all have warts, um, and not every community member buys into that philosophy, so the journalist has to kind of emphasize the importance sometimes as well. Um, the second thing is, is uh, yes, you definitely have journalists who need to interpret the data, but data is its own organism now. Data is out there. If you go to the Met Council website, they have a whole data page. It's not just journalists analyzing data anymore. It's, up, it's open source now. It's out there for anyone. And I think that's where Matt and I would probably agree and maybe push back <laughs> against Jamie a little bit. And, and I think maybe that's the challenge to us as government communicators is how can we prepare, collect, and present the data so that, with that in mind, that, right. you know what, w people aren't going to wait until they see the weekly paper that sh right. explains the story to them anymore. They're going to find it themselves and they're going to post it on Facebook before they know anything. So that might mean that we have to really reform how it is we're collecting data and how we're thinking about that. Because I think for many decades people thought, well, these are just numbers in a file somewhere and nobody's going to ask about it. And maybe our assumption now should be that the public is going to see all of this, and we need to make sure they have some context. I can agree 
executive summary or right. something when you release it. Can I, I just add to that question from the consumer point of view, <laughs> news or media consumer, right? Uh, and partially why the idea of having this conversation came about is that it's a very fine line that I've realized moving to the United States between the government PR pieces and the information delivery mm -hmm. or community building sort of a newspaper that doesn't really report the news. It's about people learning what's going on in their community, what are events happening, you know, very innocent stuff uh, versus where you would go to get the news. So those are two different things. And now I go online. It's really confusing when you're flipping your channels and you get different messages from every channel <laughs> often. And so it's the responsibility of a consumer to figure that out now, and it's difficult. Well, I, I think uh, um, one, one of the things is there's a lot of pressure on the news industry um, and a lot of pressure on the resources that reporters have available. And, you know, and this is something that I wonder if this ever, you know, uh, affects your work is, you know, you might have these set of data, um, but is it too complex? Is the issue too technical? And do you have a reporter who is an expert on that subject, or do you have a general assignment reporter? A lot, a lot of the economic pressures on the news industry uh, have resulted in fewer people with expertise and fewer people with the time to spend, uh, you know, filing freedom of information requests, going through the data uh, from the start of a, you know, a, a information request till publication um, can be, you know, months year-long process, and there's not a lot of media that is investing in that kind of work, and so it's up to organizations like yours and, um, you know, and yours to kind of fill those gaps. Вопрос. Нужно разрешение, чтобы как бы осветить какой-то вопрос? Are you saying that you need to get a permission to report on a certain issue? You need to get a permission from a government to report on the issue? No, um, no, it's it's not a permission to report. But does does the reporter understand the topic that they're that they're covering? Do they have the time to get all the details and uh -huh. the facts uh -huh. straight? Uh -huh. okay. there, there are economic pressures uh -huh. on media that are kind of scaling back some of that in-depth reporting. And so uh, things tend to get glanced over or you know, skimmed over a little bit, which, can, you know, which doesn't necessarily serve the community all that well. But it has created pockets where um, more independent sources, more local community sources have been able to rise up and fill, uh, fill that gap. And I find that uh, as a government communicator, the way I release information sometimes depends on the reporter. Because if I know there is a reporter from our local stations and they have to turn three stories on the same topic and they're coming to me two hours before a deadline, I will treat them differently than, for example, our Brooklyn Park Sun Post reporter who has a weekly paper and I can sit down and explain things to them. And the media is always going to cover what the media wants to cover. So I'm always very cognizant of that, and the way I deliver messaging actually does depend on the news organization. Well, it's, it's interesting because we're, we're kind of getting to the point there's like this idea that there's just flat out censorship, but there's also all these other ways that information gets changed or, you know, different circumstances. Like if you're two hours before, you know, that's a real opportunity to hand feed the story exactly the way you would like to hear that story. You know, and there, there's not enough time to actually in there to, to come up with something else. Are you, gonna yeah. <laughs> you know what, uh, I have like experience like 20 years in printing business and unfortunately printing business unfortunately it goes down because of uh, internet. And uh, we have um, just to implement uh, some new experience uh, because we, we've got a lot of information from government, from press release. What we do, uh, we create a really good uh, website, community portal website. So we put all news, what we have, uh, we, we put on our website, and we have forum. So people write down us what they like and what we can discuss, and after that we put in articles. I think this way it's like in real life right now because uh, online, internet, this is uh, number one. 
And that's why this um, interactive communication is really important because in this case we know, because in forum people can discuss, can exchange their opinions. And in this case, uh, we support our media because we don't, um, because uh, you're right, uh, uh, what is interesting, if uh, I will put articles or um, from our staff, from our journalists, so this is like, anyway, it's our opinion. It's not community opinion. That's why this is not, I think, not the right way to object to be, to how to reflect uh, all information. That's why I think if uh, all uh, data, all information, press release we put on website online and people can uh, send us their opinion, I think in this case it's really more um, objective information and in what people think about. You know, I want to ask folks in to, to answer a couple of questions that are going to be really getting at the transparency of everybody's work. And it's not meant to be a, like, I gotcha. <laughs> um, I think it's just meant to like highlight the structures that all of us work in. Where does the funding come for your position? Uh, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, in my organization, we have pretty robust communications, and it's split between two ways. My funding directly for my position and one assistant is directly out of the general fund, so the property tax levy supports that. We also have run five cable TV channels, and that is funded through fees that um, people who subscribe to the local cable company pay, and so that funds that staff and we directly correlate the two. But uh, a big portion of it, a couple hundred thousand dollars of communications and how we communicate are directly funded out of the local property tax. And actually, um, I did all that. Um, my salary and my uh, intern salary is paid for by the great taxpayers of the city of Brooklyn Park. Uh, um, my uh, printing magazine that I print is financed by my personal money or my friends. So the government doesn't finance me, and so they don't influence what I write. And of course, I agree with Leonid in the way that I can then uh, deliver the messages the way I see the issue or my reporters see the issue. But of course, we exist in the same conditions you are, and people can get their information now from Internet, Facebook, and other sources as well. So my uh, situation is interesting because my funding for public record media is produced by my production company. I own a television production company, so we have clients that are commercial clients, and then I save a portion of the revenue and underwrite public record media to go out and do the reporting and the data work that we seek. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, we keep a, an eye out for any particular conflicts. We're going after government data, so it doesn't interfere with the business end of what we're doing. But sometimes government holds data about particular businesses. And if we are going after that data, then we make sure to steer clear of that business sector or those particular businesses in our in the business side of what we do, so there's no conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I have uh, had my own business, which uh, operated on uh, advertising dollars. Um, currently, I'm a uh, publisher of a nonprofit uh, publication called Midwest Energy News, and that's funded by foundations um, interested in energy issues in the Midwest. Okay. Uh, I'm. On online media, but like traditional media, there's a pretty strong separation between the advertising and revenue generating side of the house and the editorial. And so I really don't know. I, I am in blissful ignorance about where our funding comes from. And that's deliberate. <laughs> that's to ensure editorial independence so that it doesn't affect my reporting. My business, uh, I support by my own because I'm owner. And of course, no, no, no money from government, from anyone else. But uh, of course, it's like I would say 70-75% is advertising dollars and 25% is subscribers. Um, and the uh, last years, like from 2007-2013, business really go down because uh, advertising is go more online. But uh, because of a specific Russian community that people really like and trust the printing world, so we, we, uh, we have opposite ways, so our subscribers is more and more. And um, uh, Russian uh, business owners, they put advertising because 
our printing um, media is completely compatible uh, with the online version. So we to we working towards more to website communication. Yeah. So thank you for asking this question. Now I can see that we all have real uh, resource that we draw on to finance yeah. what we do. Of course it's nice when there are grants or found, uh, foundations who can finance uh, certain publications. Uh, no, so again, uh, it uh, proves my point that in my publication nobody has any interest in what I published because I don't have these resources coming from any other side except my own pocket. So the whole publishing business is built on volunteers. So maybe you'll be curious to learn how we do it and you can get some ideas on how you can manage the message with a volunteer-based organization like that. Вот как в интернете вы ведете свой блог. Just like what you were describing about your specific uh, forums on the internet, we have uh, several people who have their sections that they write about and they can engage. К этому изданию мы как бы подсоединяем тоже соцсети и Facebook. And we're also connected with social networks through this У нас в Украине развита соцсети Контакт. Similar to your Facebook we have, which is called In Contact. Это похожие соцсети. И потому обсуждение уже дальше всех проблем, статьи, рубрик ведется именно в соцсетях. So we, we uh, settle, uh, set the stage, right, bring the issue forward, and then the communication just goes from there between the people who read it. Так. I think if I can add something that I think is interesting as you talk about all of the online forums that are evolving, that is directly leading to the fact that government communicators are growing as a field because now that there is so much, so many opportunities to publish information in so many different formats, a big part of our job is not just pushing stories out there, but monitoring what's being said. So when that online conversation begins, we need to check in, and we, we like seeing those conversations. We even run some of our own social media, but we have to be cognizant of if somebody makes a mistake. So the reporter may put a story up that is factually accurate, it's great, we're very happy with it, and then all of a sudden people start commenting and somebody spreads a rumor in that. It's our job to get in there and to yeah. say, hey, actually, here's the truth. So this is something new to government, and we are responding differently in this country. So in my organization, uh, we keep very open forums. We don't lock anything down. The only thing we ever delete is if it's absolute profanity, something like that. However, other cities and counties and states and so forth have said, we're not going to allow comments, which right. we, th we think philosophically goes against the principle of social media, but it's something that folks are struggling with and, and local councils struggle with. They're not sure that they want the community talking about the decision they made the night before. So I think when we talk about censorship in this country, which in modern days we like to think we've been very free of, I think we're actually seeing more of it um, in these realms. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, in, in the Ukraine or, or in Russia, what, what happens if, if there is sort of that, you know, sense that there's, there's information that's out there that the government may not agree with or may think it's misinformation? Is it... How is that dealt with? Is it? Do you even know how that that's done? I have a concrete example. Вот уже в нашем диалоге. Леонид сказал. Let's go back to the example that Leonid brought up earlier: the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. И это можно понять по-разному. And you can understand that conflict differently. И здесь нужно как бы уточнить: есть конфликт между политиками Украины и России, а между людьми нет. So, никаких войны, проблем. There might be a conflict between the politicians yeah. of the two countries. So it could be a, a very bright example when language is so important and when yeah. a reporter or a journalist expresses their uh, point of view and it needs to be clarified. In my publication, I'm doing like two pages. Here is your opinion, here is opposite opinion. And less people uh, see so, because I think it will be unfair if we will put and we will take one side or another side. And um, just uh, right now, we are really active um, 
um, discuss about this conflict. And uh, in our newspaper, you can find different points of view, who is from for Russia, who is for Ukraine. But uh, another thing I would like to mention right now, you know, a um, couple of days ago, it happened really um, tragedy in Russia. It was the uh, air crash. Uh, and um, I was uh, surprised and I was shocked how many calls we've got from our community and people try to send money to uh, be, because we are um, very sensitive to any news what's going on in Russia or in Ukraine. And I think this is good because uh, this is, uh, it shows relations that uh, people, um, so they, they love what they came from. So this is really important, I think. The whole conversation has come up a couple times about opinion-based journalism as opposed to objective journalism is interesting because in this country we have a tra two traditions. You know, at the very beginning of the country, there is a real correlation between a political party and newspapers, for instance, you know, the pamphleteering in the early part of, the, of our country's history. Uh, you even look around this state and you'll see little small town newspapers that still have Republican or Democrat in the name of the paper, you know, based on the history, that the political history. Um, I think as a, um, an ethical obligation, whether you're reporting with a, a, an editorial slant or if you're a traditional ob objective reporter where you're trying to show both sides of, of a subject, I think the ethical obligation is to make sure your facts are accurate, even as a, 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 a editorial journalist, to make sure you're not speaking about facts that are in incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people here would, would share that. Just for uh, folks listening in the Ukraine, as an interesting piece of legal uh, background, the way that um, bad facts are generally dealt with in the United States is not so much government intervention, it's two individual parties suing each other. Because there are laws that are permissible under our Constitution about libel and slander, which is saying or writing false things about other individuals. So if that happens, then those individuals can sue each other for damages, for, for monetary damages. So that's generally how that's handled here in this country. You know, I, I think it's interesting because one of the things you're bringing up, Matt, is that this kind of larger perspective that all of our work happens in a system. You know, and, and when you're referencing in, in the early years of the country, it, it, independent media had a real specific bias. But that worked to some degree because there were so many independent medias that had real specific bias. So you would read, you know, eight of them and get a sense of the story. Uh, now I think our media, and what you're, you're talking to, tries to present itself as if it is, it is objective, you know, that it doesn't have that sort of bias, that it's, it's trying to kind of cover the whole, I mean, people would argue that there are biases to a lot of our media, but that it's, it's trying to do that sort of um, not transparent or not even conscious bias Approach. I would respectfully disagree with uh, the objective subjective uh, stance that you were describing and agree that if the uh, publication like Leonid's provides both points of view, it's better for everybody and so he will get more people subscribed to the paper knowing that they're not taking subjective uh, point of view on, on the issue. They're presenting two sides which it is objective now. No. Well, it becomes curious, though, if there's three sides to an issue. You know, like if there's... Uh, yes, it uh, это было, это было, есть и будете три и десять дней. Это нормальное явление для uh, нормального цивилизованного общества. Так что... For, for any uh, normal civilized society, I think we should have more than two, and three or ten would be even better. <laughs> it, it makes, it's, it's this interesting question I want to kind of post to everybody is, when you think about your audience, I mean, I think a lot, like, so this is already a complex conversation, right? We're, we're trying to dance between, you know, government needs and, you know, and information and sometimes nonprofit versus independent media versus government needs. And so just to throw another thing in the mix here, audience, you know, like how well educated or how um, literate do you believe your audiences are for the information that they're reading? 
You know, it's like one point earlier you're talking about data. It's like, is the, is the data so complex that the audience that you know this is going to isn't going to really understand all the data? I would imagine that that comes up a lot in environmental issues. I don't think it's able to understand so much as appetite for the data. Like, I think most of our readers are capable of understanding what we communicate to them. And I think most information can be broken down into a digestible form. But that doesn't necessarily mean the people want to digest it. They may have other things they want to read about. They may not see the immediate connection to their life. They may have different preferences. I, I think that's the bigger deal than the data being too complex. I think anybody uh, who is listening to our message or reading our message will receive it differently. Uh, who somebody might receive it and process it through the eyes and lenses of economics, somebody through the eyes and lenses of politics and so forth, and we can't do anything about it. Everybody will hear what they want to hear. I think one of the challenges we have in government is that so much of what we do is, is just generally boring to the general public, and they're, they're not paying attention. And so while our city budget, which we adopt every year, and we try very hard to be transparent about all of our budget documents and all of the numbers and all of that, uh, just doesn't get attention. But then if there's a na neighborhood dispute about whether somebody should be allowed to raise chickens in the city, that's going to get headlines for weeks. So that's where we can turn to publishing documents and publishing things so that those who do want to seek it out can find it. And so that's, I think, a direction a lot of us are going. Um, and that's a real positive step we've seen in a lot of government organizations is this uh, trend to push data out to put it up online so people don't have to go in and request it. It's just available for the public to digest. So and I think that's a real positive step. If I may add, the media has an obligation for that transparency as well. In the past, the media, whenever they built their own database, for example, has tended to keep that proprietary, kept it to themselves. And now there's kind of more of a push that if I'm as a journalist going to build a database on the budgets across the state, I should make that information usable for other journalists so that they can do with it what they will. It, being equally transparent on our side, not just showing our work, but allowing other people to do their own work with that data. Do you see yourselves having a role in your different positions to sort of try to encourage readers or audience to um, be more aware of a topic? You know, like if, if something's happening and, and they may not have the appetite for it, and you know that, but do you go ahead and publish it anyway um, where's that line? How, how, how do you see your roles in that? First of all, you can build the appetite. It's not always successful. It's very hard to do, but you can build the appetite. You, I mean, for example, I've done stories like five reasons you should care about this year's audit or, or whatever, and you do stuff like that. Jamie, I'm sure you do stuff like that as well. We also spend time building relationships with journalists so that mm -hmm. if I see something really important, I'll call them up and say, hey, can you just look at this story? And try to give as little direction as possible to say, there's a really important piece of this story. And sometimes that might even be controversial, but say, can you take a look? And I, th I think the journalists appreciate that when that happens because they just simply don't have the time and resources to be watching every single thing that's happening in government. How do you manage your reputation? Like, what role does that play? Like, you know, as you're talking, it's like, okay, so you're feeding, you know, information to somebody, to a journalist, but at the same time, you know, if you're going to have that relationship for 10, 20 years, like how do each of you think about your reputation? You know, that, that credibility is so important. I mean, I, if I feed them a story that isn't that great, you know, they're not going to trust me. And so in our city in particular, we have a lot of breaking news. And so I'm going to be transparent with them and tell them exactly what's going on as much as I can tell them. Because I know if I don't, and I need their help in the future, I'm not going to get that uh, the assistance that I need from the media. Because in government, we need the media just like the media needs us. If you do have something that you don't want people to pay attention to, the, you know, the worst thing you can do is try to cover it up. Because you know, if you want people to pay attention to the budget, you might, you know, <laughs> try, not, you know, try to prevent them from having access to it. If you give them access to it, people really aren't that interested. But, you know, I just don't think in, in as far as that media government relationship, withholding anything is going to do you any favors. Um, 
again, the worst thing we can do is get caught in a lie. And I think sometimes we have to push back on some people. There are people in any organization, uh, private or public, that are going to say, let's not talk about this. But bottom line is the media is not just at our doorstep anymore. It's everywhere. So we have to be willing to do that and, and put the information out there. From a public relations standpoint, I find more challenges dealing with our residents than the media. I spend more time crafting messages for residents than our local media. It's, it's just amazing. And that has really changed in the past year or so. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to follow up on your question in terms of, if I may, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that how do you report things that happen, internal issues, employee issues, uh, corruption issues? It doesn't happen in Minnesota, hopefully. But if it were to happen, if you were to find out about it in your own city, how would you communicate that to the public? Well, I think uh, employment laws govern some of that here in this country. We can't reveal much. But if it is certainly something public and corrupt, we would turn again to the public information with our, the reports, the police department, those types of actions. Um, we do have, I think, government has um, a little bit ability to keep some of that stuff quiet. We can say it's under investigation and the law dictates only the certain things we have to release at certain times. Um, in Minnesota, typically if something is happening, particularly a criminal, in a jurisdiction, they'll ask a different policing agency or a different government agency to investigate it. And that lets us off the hook a little <laughs> bit because we're too close to it. So I could say, you know, you'll have to contact the state auditor's office and then their media person can handle it. And, uh, and the governments, when they get requests from reporters for this data, they have to very carefully analyze what they can release because some of it is by law kept private. And if they release it, they could be financially liable for damages for releasing it. Uh, and then some of it is, is express, expressly public. And uh, what is expressly public is subject to a lot of change. There's been a lot of push in Minnesota back and forth on that in the last couple of years. Well, yes, again, uh, interesting moment. Uh, uh, interesting uh, moment about uh, delivering information uh, on uninteresting topic like budget, for example. And uh, I like to point back to you how you suggested that when you hide it, it suddenly becomes interesting. Then, and so, <laughs> <laughs> so then, uh, uh, how do you know if the reporter is truthful uh, in that situation? Well, for example, a journalist or reporter. Uh, can use it as a tactic to get people interested in whatever they're writing. For example, he can say it's not available, and so then he can gain a pulse on the audience to see what actually they're interested in, what they're not. In our community, people used to say, like, we can trust two times, first time, and if it's not true, this is last time. So same thing, um, that's why uh, it's really um, hard to keep uh, trust um, whatever we put in our uh, newspaper media, because if people doesn't trust, so this is like, you know, like customer, you know, you can work five years to gain one customer and five seconds to lose customer. Same thing here. If uh, you are not trustful, nor not respectful, so this is really, um, it's a business will go down. <coughs> we talked earlier about the ability of our audience to understand the information that we're uh, trying to share with them, and uh, the reporter or journalist has to have also professional knowledge of the information that they're sharing, uh, so they're not mis misinterpreting it themselves. So, for example, when the editor of a recorded uh, interview or panel like this would cut out the most important piece of what would bring more uh, insight into the information being shared. И когда человек имел своё мнение о конкретном вопросе, это We had several occasions like that when it would be no matter public official or just a simple person uh, and the journalist will then uh, by cutting out some direct responses of those participants uh, really tweak the message. Well, I hope that when you montage this <laughs> program, you wouldn't forget <laughs> what I'm talking about and would, would было, not cut me out. <laughs> so that we're not perceived to our audience that I and Leonid have a conflict of some sort. <laughs> 
Ну, я перед тем, как бы... So it was very easy because uh, I was like a baby, I have babysitter government with uh, censorship and they tell me put this, this, this. So it was like uh, we were like robots, you know. So, um, so about political, so absolutely uh, no right, no left, only what, what they say. So that's why this is, that's why, um, you know, uh, in, in Russia they used to say, We've, we've got two main uh, newspapers in Russia. It's called Pravda uh, or uh, News. So in people say in Pravda there is no news, in News there is no trust. Trust is Pravda. So, 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 so same thing, uh, but here is when uh, you can explore wherever you want, and this is uh, absolutely freedom. So of, of course this you have to be, first of all, you have to be responsible. Uh, and, and have respect. Otherwise, uh, you will be out of business. And maybe um, we, we, we follow exactly, we never, um, in my, my experience, um, that uh, we put some wrong information or uh, some slanders or something like that. That's why probably maybe we are the only one media because uh, people trust us and, um, and we have, we have uh, influence into our community. And um, I think um, who is doing this business, it's very important to be responsible and in charge what you're saying. And I agree with um, Yuri that uh, you, you, you have to have thousand um, opinions and it's fine, but uh, it should be trustful. It should be a goal from your soul. It's, it shouldn't be, and about PR, two words. Uh, in my newspaper, we have two kinds of PR. PR of uh, advertising, so this is absolutely, this is our bread, what we, because if um, we have a really successful businessmen, so we put like a businessman of the month, a businessman of the year, so we make PR wherever is possible, because we have Russian clinics, uh, Russian, uh, you know, all the specialists. But about political, My philosophy: there is no PR. It should be objective. What it's in uh, in real time, because uh, PR this is some order from something, uh, from somebody. But if you're objective and you uh, put where, what it's it's happened, so this is I I would not say this PR. That's my opinion. You were going to say something about PR. Well, both Jamie and I are former journalists as well. So we've, we're on both sides, but the way I see the difference is as a journalist, you cover both sides of the story, and as um, government communicators, we put out the messages that our city needs to get out, and we don't worry about the other side. I, yeah, I would just expand on that. I think it's real simple. There's two parts to my job. There are the things that I put out there that I want to push that are our agenda that we want people talking about and listening to and, and hearing and promoting. It could be lots of good, fun stuff. And then there is responding to requests from journalists. And that's, that's the other half. And that is strictly media relations. And sometimes we try and get some of our PR messages into those answers to the journalists. That's us doing our best job. But they are two distinct functions. Um, and that's where um, we have marketing now in some of our tar titles and departments. It's really the PR piece. If, if I can add, I think on the ground what that, what that translates to is we do a lot of the same thing. We may get out their message. We may get out the, you know, the leaf blower is coming this day or whatever. Jur journalists definitely do that. But what journalists do that maybe a PR doesn't do is investigate. You don't really find PR people investigating their own institution, uh, hypotheticals, you know, saying what could be, you know, what if St. Louis Park was like this, or what if Hopkins was like this? And then um, you also don't see them contextualizing a whole lot. I mean, there will be contextualization if it's favorable, but you never go in with the intent of just, let's see where St. Louis Park stacks up in the West Metro, or where Hopkins stacks up in the West Metro. And that's where the journalist does something a little bit different than PR, I would say. 
Uh, we need to um, bring this conversation to a, an ending, but I want to go around and I want to ask each of you to, this is going to sound kind of cheesy, but I'm still going to ask it, is to say one word that you think of when you think about the passion behind why you do what you do. And Irina, I'm going to include you in thinking about the Global Synergy Group. Um, but one word, because you know we spent a lot of time on the checks and balance, but there's obviously a passion for why everybody comes to this. Um, and I'm just curious what that one word would be about why you do what you do. And anybody can start, and then we'll just go around from there. Self-government. Self-government. Uh, there's a media revolution happening, and it's exciting to be involved in it. That's awesome one word. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say betterment, making our community better. Um, trust and responsible work uh, to community. I would say education. We, we all have responsibility to educate each other. I would say inclusiveness to include the various different communities. All of that for me is leadership from everybody. Ну для меня как бы я не профессионал в этой области. Для меня это как бы что-то э, новое, возможность. Opportunity in you, something you know. I think for, for me and, and why I'm passionate about this is community. You know, just the sense that we get to learn a lot about each other. And I want to thank all of you for being here today to be able to have this conversation and, and opening, opening up sort of like a little bit more ideas about how each of us works a little bit differently. And, and hopefully, you know, folks that are watching this also learn a little bit more about our own media, um, whether you're in the Ukraine or you're in Minnesota or you're somewhere else in the world, to be thinking about how our story is shaped and, and how are we talking to each other so that we're using the same, same structure, same ideas. So thank you very much for tuning in and watching this program. Thank you to the Global Synergy Group. Thank you to each of our guests. There's information on the bottom of your screen for if you want to follow up learning more about any of these amazing people or to keep this conversation going, please check that out. And thank you to Masha, uh, Petrenko, Masha Petrenko for doing translation, and to a special thank you to St. Paul Neighborhood Network, which is actually where we're filming this, which seemed like the best spot given in Minnesota to film this, which is a public access station here in St. Paul. So thank you for watching, and take care.